Good afternoon. My name is Deepti Pitikiti Smith. I'm a member of the ABA Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. We're thrilled to be presenting a timely panel entitled Restorative Justice and Gender-Based Violence. Sponsored by the ABA Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence and Section of Civil Rights and Social Justice, this panel is one of many in a series of rapid response webinars. We are actively planning additional programming on a variety of issues. So please visit AmericanBar.org forward slash CRSJ for updates on these programs. During today's program, we encourage you to ask questions of our panelists through the Q&A, not the chat function. If you do not see the controls, please ensure your screen is not idle. We will address questions at the end of the panel. We will be sharing a recording of this program to everyone who has registered so that you can share it widely with your network. And with that, we're thrilled to bring you today's program entitled Restorative Justice and Gender-Based Violence. Our panelists here today are Professor Donna Coker, Professor of Law and Dean Distinguished Scholar at the University of Miami School of Law, Professor Mary P. Koss, Regents Professor in the Mel and Innit Zuckerman College of Public Health at the University of Arizona, Professor Mimi Kim, Associate Professor, School of Social Work, California University, Long Beach, and Professor Aparna Polavarupu at the University of South Carolina School of Law. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. There seems to be increased interest in restorative justice responses to intimate partner violence and sexual assault. Is that correct? And what are the concerns with our current responses? Let's start with Aparna and Donna. Okay, thank you, Diti. Um, before we jump in, I wanna first address what intimate partner violence and sexual assault might encompass, right? Because I think that that sets the stage for answering the question about the legal response. Um, first and foremost, the people committing and experiencing the violence can be any gender or sexual orientation, right? Um, intimate partner violence is known to extend well beyond physical violence. It can also include verbal or emotional violence as well as economic violence. And now I know um, advocates generally know all this, but the reality is that not all the states have caught up to this point. Um, and I wanna dwell on economic violence for a little bit just because I think it's highly under discussed. Economic violence can be quite severe uh, and is not adequately addressed by legal responses. Some examples of economic violence include withholding resources or eviction from property to which all partners have contributed, whether or not that contribution is financial. Um, and this is particularly problematic when the partners do not have the benefit of marital legal protections, right? Because then those are cases in which the law doesn't offer any remedy. So violence can encompass more than two parties. This isn't a webinar on terminology, which could be a whole other 90 minutes. Um, but in some ways, the term intimate partner violence doesn't quite capture all of these other parties and forms of violence that I think would still be intended to fall under the same umbrella, right? So for example, in some of the countries I've worked in, widow eviction, which is the act of in-laws forcibly evicting widows from their marital property, is a sig significant form of economic domestic violence. Um, in the United States as well, in-laws can be a significant contributing factor to intimate partner violence. In some families, in-laws are sometimes the source or instigator of violence against spouses or partners, um, sometimes because of community-wide norms relating to things like dowry, if that's something that's important to the community, uh, to relative status among families, or simply just the gender norms of that community. So um, in sexual assault, community relationships can also contribute to incidents of assault um, on campuses, which is a common place where we're talking about this issue, um, you might discover that relationships between the person committing the assault and their friends or other communities permitted or sometimes promoted the violence. Right? And in addition, the legal system loves the terms victim and perpetrator or offender. Um, 
But that binary doesn't always exist in ways that I've just described, but also by virtue of the fact that the harm could have been traveling in both directions between the parties or in multiple directions among several parties. Okay, so getting back to that question about why the state-centered legal response is not an option for many people um, or because it's an inadequate response, right? Our response, our options are the criminal response and the civil response. Um, just setting the criminal response aside for a second. In the civil response, you see remedies such as temporary restraining orders or child support orders. Uh, so these, at least the child support order might get at some of the economic violence issues. But an issue with both of them is that these remedies are singular in their focus, right? So they don't get at all of the factors or the nuance of the um, violence. Uh, child support, for example, may address some small part of the financial or economic manipulation, but not the whole picture. Enforcement is also a significant problem, right? Enforcement of temporary restraining orders or child support is really, really hard on a good day. So um, many people also understand that the criminal justice response is not for them, right? And I'm thinking of people who don't fit the ideal victim stereotype, um, who are not likely to be well treated by the police or the courts, and they often know who they are. And so we're talking about people who are non-white, non-middle or upper class, immigrants, not cisgender, not heterosexual, not women, right? All of these people are less likely to come forward. And just as an aside, which maybe will come up later, um, restorative, programs that are connected to the courts might often miss these people too, because they need to be picked up by the system before they're referred. Um, and also just for many people, police are not saviors, right? The state is not the savior. Uh, for any number of reasons, the state is associated with harm against particular people or their communities. And the police are known to carry violence with them. And I'll turn it over to Donna to, to discuss this a little bit more. Thank you. Um, I just want to say first that I'm I'm just so happy to be a part of this and so happy that the ABA Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence is um, addressing this important topic. And I, I know um, this is not the first time. Um, I, um, I want to pick up on what Aparna was saying about uh, the harms of um, criminal justice involvement and why so many survivors try to avoid the criminal justice system. The, um, just to point to a couple of data points, the 2015 uh, National Domestic Violence Hotline Survey found that a very significant number of the women, and they, there were women that they were speaking to, um, who called the hotline over a month, who had called the police before, a significant number said they would never call the police again. Um, and I think that's a quite damning finding. 43% um, of those said that the police had discriminated against them because as Aparna was saying, um, in the words of the researcher, they weren't the ideal victim. But what that means is that the police were discriminating against them on um, grounds of race, ethnicity. I think we all appreciate and know about that but also because uh, they discriminate against people who are poor or who are perceived to be poor. There's a very significant anti-poverty bias, as well as Aparna was saying, an anti-immigrant bias. Um, a national survey of um, service providers that I had the good fortune to be a part of in 2015 um, that was published by the ACLU. We had more than 900 respondents from all across the country and we heard exactly the same thing. It echoed what the national hotline had heard um, and that is significant bias against immigrants, significant bias against women of color, particularly African-American women, but not only bias on the basis of um, sexual orientation, gender identity, significant bias against um, people who are perceived as poor, women who were perceived as sex workers, women who were perceived as um, drug abusers. Um, and this was a consistent finding. But the other thing that we heard in that survey was that um, a number of um, service providers told us that the victims, the survivors they worked with, didn't want what the criminal justice system had to offer. 
not only because um, of the concerns about bias and mistreatment and even potential violence, um, but because they would lose control over the case, over the outcome in a way they didn't want. They wanted um, to be a part of the outcome and because they weren't looking for punitive responses. They didn't believe that um, the person who had harmed them, who very often had been the subject of um, trauma and abuse in his or her life would be um, benefited in any way, would change their behavior um, if they were subjected to the violence of the criminal system. And they didn't think that they would be better off um, if that person were um, treated in um, a, a violent and kind of in a punitive way. Um, they also said that um, I mean, the other, the other thing that is concerning, not out of that survey, I'm sorry, um, is what Sonia Shaw, who's a restorative justice practitioner, says, and that's getting to the cause of the cause, looking at the um, trauma that is a part, the, often the intergenerational violence and the trauma that is a part of why people commit violence. It's also not looking at the economic connections as Aparna was suggesting. So what we're seeing now in response to the other part of Dipti's question is yes, there is a huge, there's been really quite a sea change in some significant ways. We're seeing state coalitions against domestic violence and sexual assault, for example, um, change their orientation, change their messaging, change their advocacy. They're moving away from crime-centered kinds of responses, from putting so much effort into criminal justice and criminal justice um, coalition building and reform and instead shifting to, for example, housing advocacy, um, changing the structural inequalities that support and maintain violence. Um, we're seeing, uh, for example, the National um, Coalition for the Defense of Battered Women, Sue Ostoff, um, is uh, providing support for these coalitions and we're seeing directors of these coalitions significantly change their process. And for that, I'm gonna turn back to Aparna, who's gonna talk a little bit about the efforts that she's doing in South Carolina. Um, thanks, Donna. Yeah, um, this has been pretty interesting to people, I think, because people have, um, people don't expect South Carolina, I think, to be a place where uh, restorative justice might be of interest. Uh, just for some background, I'm working on an initiative to educate about and promote the development of restorative justice practices in South Carolina. Um, and I want to make clear, I've been working on this for well over a year, right? I think a lot of people assume, well, now people are interested. The interest has been in South Carolina for, you know, a while now. Um, it's, um, you know, there are a number of people who have been working with uh, offenders, with um, people who've experienced violence, um, have all agreed and come to me and said, you know, that what we have is not working. We need to find a better way. Um, just for some background, for every year that data has been collected, South Carolina has been in the top five states for a number of women that have been killed by male partners. That is just not a list that you want to be the top of. We started out as number one and we went down to number five, not because we got any better, but because other states have gotten worse. Um, it's been very clear, right, to a number of people for many years now that our current options are not working. Um, and in addition, as Donna points out, many, many, um, many, many people who are experiencing the violence don't want the criminal outcomes. They don't want the criminal justice approach. Um, and in a way, this is a really great state to work on this because um, there are still so many small communities. People are very interested in community-driven approaches. They would rather go to community leaders than to local courts. Um, but yes, we've been doing quite a lot of coalition building. And I'll stop here at, at of um, interest of time. But if anyone wants to know more about it, please feel free to reach out. And let me just, uh, let me, I'm, I'm glancing at the chat over here. So we'll post all of this information. I'll post the research studies I'm referring to. Great, thank you. You know, it is, 
scary and you know, and there are many reasons, especially in the current environment, why restorative justice was, is an appropriate response. Um, and you know, many of us in um, in this field are wondering what is restorative justice? What are its purposes, its goals? And um, this information I think will be helpful as we implement these programs in our local jurisdictions. Um, and so I would love to hear more on what the process is to set up these programs, um, you know, what the uh, survivor centric model looks like. Um, and I would love to hear from Mary, followed by Mimi and Aparna. Um, I think I'd like to start out with six points about what is restorative justice. And then I think at a later point, I, I'd love to describe a specific program that we ran here in Pima County, Arizona. Here's the six points I'd like to make about what is restorative justice. First of all, it's a big umbrella. A lot of programs stand underneath it. Many of them are not restorative. Many of them are not good or effective. So we have to avoid overselling restorative uh, justice and, and um, be, be cautious about how our name is used. Uh, second point, restorative justice is innovative, although it has ancient roots. It's uh, not the same thing as more humane procedures tacked onto uh, traditional adversarial approaches. Those you could call adversarial justice enhanced by restorative components, but you should not call them restorative justice. Point three, restorative justice is forward thinking by definition. If you uh, begin a restorative process by an admission that uh, harm has been done, the point of the process is not to look back and figure out who's to blame. The point of the process is to look forward and think about how did it hurt people and what can we do about it. Um, third, the fourth point, that restorative justice expands the victim concept. We've traditionally thought in terms of the direct victim who's the evidence for the state. In a restorative point of view, there is a direct victim, a primary victim. There are also secondary victims and those include the victim's family, friends, and also those of the person responsible for ca causing the harm. The uh, third group of people are the community. My area is sexual assault, and it turns out that one of the major predictors of whether people feel safe in their community is how their, uh, how their community responds to sexual assault. So our community response, it, it impacts, it lowers the quality of life if our community response is not seen as adequate. Uh, five, restorative justice imposes meaningful accountability. No one has mentioned specific points, but for sexual assault, the conviction rate at trial is 13%. And surveys have indicated that basically about of 1,000 self-reported cases of sexual abuse that go into the pipeline, one case drops out at the end of a person who's incarcerated. That is not meaningful in accountability. And it's, uh, it once was called sexual assault is just regulated. It's not really illegal. My last point is that restorative justice is victim focused. It, it attempts to address what victims say their justice needs are, what they say they're looking for from a justice process, which doesn't mean that justice is the primary thing on their agenda because survival needs uh, are certainly something that people are, are concerned with before they can even get to the luxury of thinking about how do I seek justice for this? What do victims want? They want to be validated as a legitimate victim. They want to tell their story and be heard. 
they want to have acknowledgement from the wrongdoer that it wasn't about the victim. It was something that the wrongdoer decided to do. Um, they want to, victims want to make decisions about how their case is handled. And they also want to contribute to the accountability that's imposed on the wrongdoer. They want it to be meaningful to them, not something that's meaningful to the state. Um, and especially not carceral or um, monetary responses are universally desired. And finally, victims want to reclaim the power that they lost by being hurt and by being acted upon by another person and having no ability to stop what was happening. So restorative justice has ultimately the aim of delivering on, we want to empower people. Well, empower people means leaving victims after a process feeling they have reclaimed their power. So um, I'm actually going to take this one and Aparna is going to take the next, the next question. Um, I, it's always hard to go after Mary Koss. Um, you know, I just kind of want to stand up and go, yes. Um, so um, I'll, I'll, just, I'll just see if I can add a couple of things here. Um, I, I think first, there's a lot of confusion around restorative justice in some ways because um, the term is actually used to encompass a number of different kinds of processes. Um, and I wanna emphasize that one of the things that binds um, restorative justice, despite the differences in processes, is this focus that Mary was talking about um, and that's focusing on the harm that was caused. So the um, classic kind of description that Howard Zare uses and other uses, uh, others point out is that, well, um, the, the um, conventional criminal justice system is backward looking, is focused on who did it and what punishment that do they deserve. The restorative justice response is forward looking in a way it's focused on what is the harm? Who was harmed? What are their needs? Who's responsible uh, for meeting those needs and how can those needs be, be met? Um, one thing I should mention, I'm sorry, I should have mentioned a second ago, is that restorative justice is also refer, uh, used to refer to circles that are prevention, that are community building, that are not around particular instances of harm, but rather to develop the capacity within relevant communities to respond to harm. Um, it's also a term that's used for surrogate programs when um, you have uh, persons who have committed uh, particular kinds of harms meet with victims who experienced a similar harm, but it wasn't the person they harmed. But what we're talking about today are what I would call match dialogues. That's when you have some communication between the person who caused harm and the person that they harmed. Um, one of the questions I saw in the chat, I can't help it, I'm drawn to the chat, um, is, is something I wanted to address. And that's this question about what does it mean for the responsible party to admit? Um, what does it mean for the responsible party to, um, to acknowledge that they caused the harm? And I think lawyers, um, myself included, um, are very focused on this because if we, we think about mental states, obviously, and we think about what does it mean when somebody pleads guilty, for example. In restorative practices, for the most part, what this generally means is the person acknowledges that they engaged in the conduct. So if they say somebody else did it, that's not a restorative justice case, right? It doesn't necessarily mean that they, um, that they agree that they committed all the elements that might be um, subject to a charge, but it does mean that they agree they engaged in the conduct. And then what happens, and I think this is really critical, is there's a great deal of preparation that occurs. Um, and, and the people who are gonna talk about specifics next and the next question will address this, but a great deal of preparation occurs in working with the person um, who was harmed and in working with the person who committed harm. And part of that preparation is determining whether or not this person who acknowledges that they committed the conduct is also um, willing and able 
to um, acknowledge the harm that was committed. Most people don't start at that place. They don't start, they don't start at, at understanding the harm that they committed. That's a process that I think happens over time. And the, the people, uh, the practitioners will tell you more about that in the next question. Um, the other thing I would just mention is that uh, one of the primary, not the only, but primary match dialogues that and, the, and that we'll be talking about somewhat are family group conferencing or community conferencing. Um, this um, is a, a very common um, method of restorative justice developed really in the Maori system, but developed, um, but it's very similar to um, Navajo peacemaking, for example, and other processes, other indigenous processes. And the, um, the benefit of the family group conferencing or community conferencing is it brings together supporters of both um, the person who was harmed and the person who committed harm. So there's this ability, as Mary has written about, to reach the, um, the larger circle of harm, the people who were harmed because someone that they loved was harmed, um, and the family member of a person who's been accused of committing harm, who are themselves maybe feeling great shame um, and, and harm as well. Um, the other thing that restorative justice can do um, doesn't always do, none of these processes always do, but has the potential to do is to interrupt the social supports for intimate partner violence. And this is one of the reasons I get, I'm so excited about, about RJ. Um, by addressing those intergenerational um, aspects that are sometimes true, by addressing the familial supports or the network supports for abusive and controlling behavior, restorative justice has the opportunity to interrupt that, to transform those connections that Aparna was talking about. Um, and, and it also has the potential I think to, um, in, in its best form, to gather supports, or in what some forms, to gather supports for survivors. So by changing those um, social supports, but sometimes also that means material supports. So family members, extended family, um, who become, who transform their understanding of the relationship, who move from a victim blaming to victim support, are very often um, able to provide other kinds of support um, for the victim from through that process. Mimi. Mimi, you're on mute. Yeah, thank you so much. The descriptions and definitions of restorative justice just given by Mary um, Koss and Donna Coker. But I did want to use this opportunity to bring in another form of justice that some of you have been hearing about um, that is transformative justice or what I might call TJ just um, for short. Um, I'm sure many of you have heard about transformative justice and some of you may be very familiar with the term. However, there's a lot of confusion about what is transformative justice, what's restorative justice, and what are the differences between the two, if any. Um, I have to say that for some, the politics and methods are pretty interchangeable, but I want to talk a little bit about the lineage, and I think that's an important thing to address. Um, transformative justice has a different lineage than restorative justice, and we might all trace our lineage back to Indigenous people in the United States, Canada, New Zealand, the cultures that we all come from. Um, I think many of our people have somewhere in our history stand in a circle to talk, discuss, figure out resolutions to problems, including those of violence. But the more contemporary trajectory of transformative justice or TJ in the United States is rooted in communities of color and speaks to our desire to address harms or violence that we inflict on each other, interpersonal violence, gender-based violence, um, child abuse and so on, but also to address the harms of the state. Um, if we look back to the early writings of Howard Zare, um, who's considered, I think, the grandfather or the godfather of Western restorative justice, we know that he warned about restorative justice processes that take place within systems really of any sort, advocating for community embedded processes. But if you look today at, uh, at the restorative justice arena, we see that's very much occupied by restorative justice processes that assume some kind of relationship with law enforcement. 
we found, find RJ taking place within prisons and jails as a diversion to incarceration, but still tied to the system. RJ in which virtually all the participants are criminal justice involved, referred, and where criminal justice system has the ultimate deciding power over the shape of the program, its personnel, and in many cases, the fate of its participants. Transformative justice or TJ on the other hand, is not tied to law enforcement. It's embedded in a politic that is anti-carceral and for many abolitionist. It's a framework, a way of life that's centered on our interdependent relations with each other, our communities and to many to the land that is based on the belief that our collective good and perhaps even our very survival are both definable and achievable through community and collective action. It's not a criminal justice frame. It's not a therapeutic frame. It's not a service frame. It is, I believe, an organizing frame. Uh, TJ, like RJ, is invested in collective definitions of harm, the belief that individual harm extends to friends, family, communities, that our collective bodies, our communities can also be the source of understanding, safety, accountability, and change. The differences are the em emphasis and in fact insistence on the full divestment from the criminal legal system. The understanding that individual forms of harm are rooted in conditions of poverty, racism, ableism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, nativism, and so on, and cannot be understood as separate from these conditions. The understanding that the sense that we could restore things to their previous good order are meaningless, given that for many of us, there was little good to begin with. And that in fact, what we are looking for is transformation, not only of individuals, but our relationships and the very conditions that underlie society as we know it today. In that way, I would say that TJ practices are inseparable from TJ politics. The second point I wanna make is that we would not be sitting here today on this panel in the way we are talking if it were not for the foundational work of black indigenous and other people of color and the work largely carried out by femme identified, many of whom are disabled people of color. A huge force behind transformative justice and I would argue the resurgence of this interest in restorative justice has been, for example, Insight, Women of Color Against Violence, now called Insight, Women, Transgender, and Gender Nonconforming People of Color Against Violence, which centered an analysis of gender-based violence and state violence since its formation in 2000. Since that time, Insight and others have been making the claim that we must use non-police collective responses that are rooted in communities most affected by violence, that's including police violence and that we can and we must do so to address domestic and sexual violence. Insight was founded 20 years ago. It has not only been making this argument, but has been nurturing a whole field of transformative justice practices since that time. And while the topic of this panel may be new to some in this audience, to some of us, this has been literally decades, if not generations in the making. I uh, just want to point to some organizations that have experimented with what transformative justice might look like in practice. Um, Creative Interventions, an organization I founded in 2004, many others, Community Against Rape and Assault, Philly Stands Up, Support New York, Safe Outside the System, which is part of, part of the Audrey Lord Project, Spirit House, Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective, Project NIA, Spring Up, just practice, I just wanna say there are many others and we've been doing this together, each developing a different set of processes but with a shared set of values and skills. Um, I want to bring this up even though the program I'll focus on in this webinar is a restorative justice program in Contra Costa County that I'll talk about later. Um, I just wanna urge you to, to become aware of the distinctions between transformative justice and restorative justice and to ensure that this work that we're talking about here and now does not uh, do what I fear, which is squeeze the life force out of the anti-carceral and abolitionist work of black indigenous and other people of color. Hi, uh, this is Deep D. I apologize. We are having storms in Northern Virginia and the power is out. Um, thank you, Mimi. <laughs> I'm uh, logged on uh, using my cell phone. Um, I wonder, I, I think, you know, we were talking about specific programs and I, I'm not sure we, if we got to that point, I wanted to um, pivot to Mary um, to talk about her program specifically. Okay, well, I'm practicing for teaching, and 
uh, everyone tried to help me and we're not sure we have it yet, but there, that's the wrong one. Um, let me see if I can get, even if you see the notes you, I don't care because <laughs> we're gonna go with what we get here. So I'm talking about a program that was run in Pima County, Arizona. It was for sex crimes. Where did the idea from it come from? I had this wake up dream where I realized I had been doing work following survivors from uh, two, two years of recovery since rape. The, and I realized that the major predictor of how long your symptoms last and how severe post-traumatic symptoms are are predicted by self-blame. And I just had this moment where I realized how can we offer justice for that is a process that involves assessing blame and assigning consequences. It, it's a car wreck. So that's when I started reading more about what are the alternatives and really express my thanks to Kathleen Daly for the extent that she's uh, influenced me. Donna already mentioned the terrible extent to which, uh, well, let me reframe it and say, there are so many awful things that have been done in face-to-face -face dialogue, including just throwing people together in a room um, without any preparation, without any supervision, and they just turn out to be a traumatizing disaster. I would like to let you know that there, this is only part of the 39 things we thought about in trying to design this program so that we could attempt to come to grips with both victim concerns and with those concerns that uh, relate to the responsible persons. Some of these are more psychological concerns, safety concerns, and other ones of them are constitutional uh, and other legal rights. So as you can see from this slide, and you could probably read from the notes if they showed, um, I think they do actually, um, <laughs> that Donna very well prepared or had described what the preparation period of our process was. Our referrals and consent, our referrals came from prosecutors, but we were not located in criminal justice we uh, we only got our referrals and then for those people who were not successful, their cases were sent back. Otherwise, our process was a full resolution and resulted in us, those persons who successfully completed the program having no record of a, of a sex offense. And um, although they're that they were known to the system was recoverable. I have a FAQ that accompanies these company, this presentation available. It's already been given in. So hopefully you'll look at it and realize that we did think about a lot of things. So after we prepare the victim, the family, any community representatives, work with the victim to select who, in case there's anybody not appropriate to attend on behalf of the responsible person, we hold a conference. And then after that, 12 months of supervision on a template program of, of rehabilitation that is also amplified by um, aspects that are meaningful to the victim. So Mary, Mary gonna, yeah. I'm, sorry, I'm sorry to interrupt you, but it looks like um, you might need to reshare your slides because they're not advancing. Oh. Is yeah. that working now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, well, this is working even better than I was. Mm -hmm. I love to make mistakes before 1,500 people, don't you guys? <laughs> uh, 
at, 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 at any rate, so now they're advancing. One of the big criticisms of programs like this is that they're soft justice. So if you speed read this slide, you'll see we paid a lot of attention to making meaningful accountability, um, not just letting people off the hook with a soft apology. This program was qualitatively and quantitatively evaluated. So this slide just summarizes for you what our experience was with people completing the program, how many didn't complete and how many reoffended. I would like you to know that those who uh, were terminated from the program as unsuccessful were referred back to prosecutors and absolutely not a happened. Uh, to, to them, which you could all probably predict. We use a survey to find out uh, the points of view of all the groups of people who participated, but here I'm just going to emphasize about what survivor victims told us. Uh, and generally speaking, satisfaction data is not very good data uh, scientifically, but because this still remains the only quantitative evaluation of face-to-face -face restorative conferencing for sex crimes, uh, it, it's meaningful to look at. So we did achieve very high satisfaction ratings with the process that we presented. Uh, and that's kind of unusual with justice because people oftentimes aren't very satisfied. We were also interested in, did people go away feeling procedural justice? Was justice done? And what about the people who were responsible? How fair did they feel the process was? So this slide summarizes that. People have a lot of concern about whether this process can be done in a safe way. So I have this slide just to quickly say that we did measure post-traumatic stress symptoms with a standardized survey um, at intake and after the conference, which is separated by several months. And we, I'm comparing it here with data over a similar time period taken from rape crisis centers. And so you can see that um, I wouldn't be comfortable making any conclusion from this other than saying it didn't help, it didn't harm. Sexual assault is traumatic, but for those people who really can, are concerned about safety, we, we couldn't support your case, at least in the sense of psychological harm. Um, afterwards, we asked people why they participated and just you might be interested that survivor victims, uh, responsible people and family and friends have some differences, but not totally in what they select as their ma major two reasons for why they, um, they participated. This, I think last slide is, I'm not gonna say much about it. It's just that for those people, the paper is already given in, but for those people who wanna know how long did it take, how much did it cost, blah, blah, blah. That's what that's about. <laughs> One of our hopes was that by offering an alternative, we could get more people to report. This is a t-shirt for the clothesline project made by one of our participants. I would like to say more about it later, but um, I can tell you from working at rape crisis centers and then running this program, that I almost felt like we had a bouncy floor underneath our uh, offices that people really, um, instead of being put into a system that gives them a mental health diagnosis, they really, this to me says, some hopefully many victims came out of it feeling empowered. And I think that's my turn. If I can figure out how to stop sharing. <laughs> there you go. Thank you. Um, yes, thank you. I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, our restorative justice program. Now, I just wanna say that because there's been a pretty much of a ban against the use of restorative justice with respect to domestic and sexual violence because of taboos, fund funding restrictions, and in some cases by law. Um, we are still struggling at an early stage of development. Um, that may not be true for other indigenous communities that have been continuing their practice throughout. Um, I think I wanna thank Mary Koss for this really important work with Restore. 
uh, Linda Mills, who has done some of this work, Sujata Balega, and our earlier pioneers who really supported my own TJ and RJ work, um, Joan Pinnell and Gail Burford. Gail Burford. Um, our program is called the Community Restorative Justice Solutions. It's situated in Contra Costa County, which is just north of Oakland and Berkeley in the Bay Area. Um, I've called it a Planets Align project. It's tying together various people who I've known in my life and who have been working towards um, different types of innovative approaches for the past 20 years. And uh, we have come together to form this time a restorative justice pilot program to address gender-based violence and a restorative justice project that does not rely on law enforcement. And this is very unusual. We've come together as a collaborative of nine agencies that serve Contra Costa County. Uh, they include an agency that serves the deaf community, Deaf Hope, the Latinx community, which is a Latina center, um, youth of color, which is through RISE, the diverse South Asian community, NARICA, the LGBTQ community, Rainbow Center, and largely black and brown people coming out of jails and prisons and seeking employment, Rubicon. We also have more mainstream partners that include the Family Justice Center and the local shelter and batter intervention programs at STAND. While a couple of the organizations identify with the TJ movement, transformative justice movement and its political philosophy, I would say that includes Deaf Hope and RISE, others do not. They work with law enforcement, they might not be crazy about that relationship, but they are not planning, at least for now, to divest from this relationship. Some because they believe in it, and some just as a practical measure, and that survivors still do turn to the police. And we'll need the support and advocacy of these organizations to make sure that support is beneficial and least harmful as possible. So each organization is sending at least two people to be trained as a circle keeper. Each is figuring out how they will integrate the emerging restorative justice approach into their program, or at least be a conduit for those in their community seeking this approach. Each is figuring out its ties with the other organization that are part of the collaborative, creating what we hope will be a network of access and support for the many diverse communities that make up the county. Uh, we are primarily being trained by Sujata Baliga under the restorative justice processes that she learned from Kay Pranis and others. It's my understanding that Kay learned her processes through Harold and Phil Gattensby, members of the Karkaras, Tagish, and Dhaka Tlingit First Nations in the Yukon. While I'm not sure that Harold and Phil will <laughs> recognize what we're doing right now in Contra Costa County, and I was actually supposed to be there in the Yukon this week, um, I wanna give them thanks and honor them and their people for sharing their wisdom through all of these other people who have then shared their ways with us. And as we've learned together, the lessons from creative interventions and other transformative justice, um, Initiatives have also influenced the kind of practice we're developing today. We have trained circle keepers, there are two co-keepers for any process. They are facilitators, not therapists, not peer counselors, not advocates or even service providers in the usual sense of the term. They ask questions, they support people to come up with their own answers. Um, RJ, as does TJ, relies upon value setting and preparation, as others have said. Much of the beginning involves questions about goals an invitation to people who are friends, family, community members, or what Bay Area Transformative Justice Collective would call one's pod, if you're familiar with that term, please become familiar, to participate in the process. I would say that each meeting, particularly as we bring in more people, is like a small circle. The questions, what is the nature of harm? Who's responsible for, and what are each of our roles in addressing that harm? What can we do to make things right underlie each step? we may not end up meeting with the person who's caused harm. This is based upon the survivor's desire to or not to include them, that person's willingness or lack thereof of engaging with the process, the level of danger and other factors. So we may have a circle that involves friends or family members, some of whom may not have been supportive, may have contributed to violence. We may be using a circle to increase the safety that they can provide, increase understanding and trust, improve communication, address harm, each situation so far has been entirely unique. Due to the influence of Joan and Gail, who have been advisors to our program from the start and who are very child-centered, we who would not have otherwise done this now include children in the circles and center their presence. Our ultimate aim is to create a system of alternative justice, for lack of better word, options that not only rely upon a network of diverse organizations, but that ultimately bring the knowledge and practice to the level of the grassroots community. While we do want to be proficient at what we do, 
We're trying to deeply understand these processes so that we can share that knowledge and those skills back to families and community members, equip many diff diff diverse and various people in the community to be able to do this work, and make these ultimately everyday practices that can be carried out at all levels of the community at all ages. Uh, we're a pilot, we're in early stages, we're still figuring it out. This actually is the first time I've publicly shared that we have a program. We have purposely kept ourselves way below the radar. We are in tender experimental stages. We are evaluating the project. Please do not call us unless you are in Contra Costa County and are asking for a circle. We have, like others, been held back by COVID. It's hard to do processes or even preparation when the person you may need to talk about is sitting right next to you. It's hard to do a circle in the squares of a Zoom call. We anticipate sharing our knowledge by the end of next year, COVID or none. Uh, most of our participants are people of color. Many have been from or include LGBTQ family members. Many live in homes occupied by two or three generations, sometimes in a house or across a few blocks, sometimes all together in a one bedroom apartment. Most of our organizations represent and serve communities of color and or other marginalized communities, the deaf community, the queer community. Most of our circle keepers have been people of color. This leadership by and centering of people of color is central to our work and highly unusual in the restorative justice world, uh, at least today. We are proud of our work. We see this as also aligned with transformative justice, even if we do not make a claim to be a transformative justice project. And we look forward to knowing more and sharing more when our pilot period draws to an end next year. We hope to stay a strong and sustainable project beyond the pilot period. And we look forward to being open to your questions and invitations at that time and share whatever we know with all of you. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Mimi. Um, I want to talk a little bit about um, a comparative example. I know that I'm, I'm pretty sure our whole audience is in the US, but I think there's value in um, um, seeing some seeing some comparative examples. And specifically, I'm thinking of the use of reconciliation in Uganda. Um, I studied Uganda because well, I had some years of work there. But um, I think the example of reconciliation in Uganda is very interesting and important to take note of because it's a nationally sanctioned approach, right? So it's a very interesting approach to, um, you know, a restorative style of justice. Um, and I'll explain why I say restorative style in a minute. Uh, reconciliation is provided for in the Ugandan constitution and under several different laws in Uganda, including the Domestic Violence Act. Um, the Constitution directs courts to promote reconciliation. The DV Act recognizes reconciliation as a potential outcome of domestic violence cases. Um, and it's important to note, however, that reconciliation was being used by people in Uganda well before the passage of this, this act. So, um, you know, th there was some mention of, of whether and to what degree the state even has a role, you know, in restorative justice. Um, and, you know, I'm one of those people that thinks the state should largely stay out of it. Um, and in a way, the state in Uganda has, right? Beyond saying we accept it, they haven't defined what reconciliation is, right? And so it's actually quite a decentralized process. Um, and it's implemented in different ways by different groups. So drawing from some of what Mimi was saying about transformative justice, depending on where you are, what community you're in, what tribe you're part of, your process, your practice is going to look different um, just because it's so impacted by your community, uh, your culture, and what you're up against, really. Um, so there's no uniform step-by-step -step method. Um, but there are some core characteristics and it looks a lot like conferencing, which has already been mentioned um, by Donna, at least. Um, so in typically, right, you have um, the parties come together. Um, oftentimes third party community members are invited to participate because the community is viewed as having a significant interest in the process. Um, family members are asked to participate. Um, Usually the people seeking reconciliation are women um, in the case of domestic violence. So women are coming and seeking reconciliation 
And they often are the ones requesting the presence of traditional or community leaders. So I skimmed some of the questions and I, you know, there were a lot, I didn't get a lot out of them. But one thing that was mentioned was, um, was um, you know, problematic norms in the community. How do you deal with that? How do you deal with people who try to push you back together? Um, and that was one of the questions I asked when I was working in Uganda and, and speaking to facilitators. Um, and it is an issue. I mean, you know, I'm not going to pretend that it's not an issue. I'm not going to pretend that we're that these groups are not up against some very patriarchal practices or norms. Um, some of these communities do enable violence against women. Um, but what's worth noting is that in many, many cases, the women were the ones, the women who were experiencing the violence were the ones asking for the leaders to attend. In a way, some of them said they wanted them to be held accountable too. They wanted them to hear what was happening. Um, several of the facilitators used sort of um, existing norms and existing practices to try to, I mean, I, Mimi can tell me if this is really right, but if, to try to maybe be a little bit more transformative in their approaches, so not just RJ between the parties, but um, try to change community views. So oftentimes you have this conferencing that's paired with dialogue building in the community, right? The development of community change agents. Um, one organization, set of it, um, had developed guidelines for advocates that were seeking to facilitate reconciliation so that it didn't just turn into a really terrible mediation um, that just pushed the woman back into an abusive relationship. Um, but they also developed community interventions that were designed to be paired with reconciliation. So they worked with numerous communities. Um, they worked with organizations that were facilitating reconciliation and paired them with these dialogic programs. So um, they trained members of the community and all sorts of service providers who would come in contact with uh, victims of domestic violence and say, um, and train them on, on how to begin the conversation, how to talk about power imbalances, how to talk about the gendered nature of a uh, number of power imbalances and um, how to intervene, right? And uh, it's still pretty new, but a number of the, they've done now two studies and both have shown um, that in the communities in which they're engaging in this uh, programming, in addition to the restorative justice work, what they're also seeing is some change in norms, right? More and more people are responding that they understand that violence is not acceptable. They are recognizing the ways in which they are contributing to or supporting or facilitating violence. Um, so that's, that's been a positive move in a country that also has really significant problems with domestic violence where gender-based violence is, um, is, you know, it's a real, real issue and prevalent. Um, another organization, FIDA Uganda, took a different tack. Again, they are also engaging in this reconciliation approach. Um, what they've been doing is meeting with community leaders and asking them to write down norms. This is really interesting. They're writing down norms saying, what do you believe in, right? And um, they start, you know, a, num a number of them are very gendered, right? Women should only do X, Y, and Z. Women can't own property. Um, sort of all of the things that are, that are contributing to the violence against women. Um, but they're also highlighting other norms children are the future of our community. We have to protect children above all else. Um, and using that to, again, pairing that while they're engaging in these reconciliation processes to try to shift community members' norms. Um, and I do wanna point out a couple of other things. This is, a, this is voluntary, right? So um, this is an option for the, and again, it's, I, I've just not seen, I've only seen women engage in this. So I'm just using the term women. For women who, um, this is an option for women who don't want to go through the court system, who don't want to deal with the police, who don't want to deal with the state. And again, there are a lot of the same issues. There's distrust generally. Um, many people don't view the courts as legitimate. There are a lot of obstacles, just like 
practical obstacles to using the courts that we didn't talk about, but financial, the interruption of life. Um, and they'd rather go through their community leaders or their community organizations. Um, and I also wanna acknowledge, I think everyone, all of the speakers have acknowledged this and I wanna say this again, um, we can't pretend this is a panacea, right? It doesn't always end perfectly. Um, and I think actually it does real harm to the movement when people try to act like it's the, the fix. Um, but the reality is our current system isn't the fix, right? And we talked about all of the harms that people face at the hands of police in the state. Um, and the majority of women who are experiencing this in Uganda want reconciliation, right? They consider this a better option. Um, and I'm not suggesting that you can say because women there want it, that women other places want it too. I'm just pointing out that this is really, um, for a large group of women, the, the more natural choice, right? Um, reforming the system, reforming the laws, trying to make better police is just not gonna give them what they want, um, whether or not that that can actually happen. Um, the other thing I wanna say, because I did talk about this a little bit, was these this pairing of reconciliation and these conferences with these broader community level programs have really allowed for something that I think that the state justice system has not been able to do. Um, and it's allowed for norm negotiation and normative change, right? And I think that's something that's really powerful and can impact um, people's lives in a much broader, longer term way, if done correctly. Um, because reconciliation is so decentralized, because people can develop it as they see fit, you do have some really great programs and then you do have some that don't work so well. Right? And that's just what's going to happen. Um, I don't think that having a centralized model makes sense because it's not going to work for all communities. Um, and frankly, like I said, this sort of over-regulation by the state has already caused so many problems and just perpetuated harm against women in so many ways in Uganda. Um, However, the decentralized model does mean that we're seeing real disparity in quality. And it is something that hopefully as time goes on, as these national level movements are trying to develop better and better practices and sharing practices, we can just see a general uptick in how well these are being implemented and how well they're responding to the needs of um, the parties and in how well they're responding to community factors. Thank you. Thank you. And, and you know, as you all highlighted, this is one solution, not the solution. And it's important to um, acknowledges, uh, acknowledge uh, some of the drawbacks and just cautionary issues. Um, so, you know, Donna, are there addition, additional cautions that you would add? Um, sure. I, I, um, I, I wanted to, if I could just take a second um, by way of background, I, I skipped this at the beginning because I was concerned about time and um, I think I have the, I think I have the minute to do it. Um, and, and that's just to uh, share a little bit about what brought me to this work um, and in a personal way. So I've been involved in doing work in um, domestic violence since 1978. Um, I've worked in shelters. Um, I worked in community-based programs. We had um, court-ordered um, um, men who were in a batter's intervention program. I co-facilitated those and I ran the uh, support side of a community-based project um, all before I went, went to law school. And, um, and we were, of course, about changing the networks and the social structures that maintain and cause violence. And what I saw over the course of the work, it seemed to me, was that we became increasingly invested in changing the criminal justice system. That that became like, um, that became a primary focus. And of course, in many ways that was overdetermined. Um, that was the national response to every kind of uh, problem. It was the national response to inequality was to call it a criminal justice issue and to, and to punish. 
Um, and it's also, of course, because the um, federal dollars were all about supporting the criminal justice system. So, and, and Mimi has written so well about carceral creep and I'll just send you to Mimi's work uh, to develop that more. Um, so I don't think it was all about, it wasn't just us. It was very much in, in the, you know, has been the norm now for quite a while. So that's what led me to be very interested in looking at other kinds of responses because I saw that the women I was working with were not well served, it wasn't what they wanted. And um, that's what led me to do the research I did in the Navajo Nation and looking at their peacemaker courts. And as Aparna was just saying, I didn't, you know, my research in peacemaker courts didn't find that they were perfect. And I don't think any of these projects or programs are perfect are there. Um, and I would, and they should never be um, imposed. And this is really to the cautionary side, never imposed. Um, on a survivor who isn't seeking this, um, not imposed um, um, as a matter of direct or subtle coercion. And then that's one of the key, um, I think that's one of the key things that you need um, facilitators to be really um, aware of and when they're working with a survivor before it, um, who's trying to determine whether this is what they want, um, to be really aware of those kinds of coercion that can be involved. Um, other kinds of cautions I would just suggest are that I think that um, programs that work with the criminal justice system um, have to be very concerned about the um, importing the biases of the system into the process. So um, that means looking at um, keeping data so you know whether there's um, racial bias in terms of who gets referred and who doesn't. Um, it means um, being um, um, having a process that is not controlled, um, that's controlled as less as is possible um, by the criminal justice system, which has um, brings a whole set of logic about people and about how they change and about what accountability looks like. And those um, that those kinds of thinking, something I have called crime logic can invest um, restorative, you know, projects that are called restorative justice as well. The, um, and I think there's also a, a, a problem with, I would encourage all of us out there to support transformative justice and community-based restorative justice projects. Um, there's a real problem that um, of this being the new shiny thing and that the criminal justice system will swallow it and it will be really no different than problem solving courts because I, I think that's the slot in which prosecutors are inclined to want to put it. Um, and, um, and so it won't have the kind of, uh, the problem there is it won't have the kind of transformative possibilities that Mimi described. Um, and the other problem is that it will limit, um, by doing that it limits access to uh, people who have no interest in going through the door of the criminal justice system. Um, and thirdly, can create some of the same kinds of problems that we're seeing um, on, the, on the misdemeanor side. Um, the, um, um, and, and I guess the, the other thing I would just add to that is I think it's really important for us, those of us who've been doing um, work in the IPV field for a long, long time, um, to recognize the ways in which um, the kinds of criminal remedies that we've pursued have been really, really harmful. Um, and one thing I didn't mention before is that, I don't think I mentioned, is the way in which those criminal remedies have, even on the misdemeanor side, have been so freighted with um, um, other kinds of collateral consequences in the way we've seen with other misdemeanors across, across the country. And that is to um, both in, uh, limit access to um, occupational licensing, have potential deportation kinds of consequences, um, just to name a few. And then in addition, uh, the kinds of fees and fines that we've seen um, that have created such um, racial disparities across the country. We see it in the domestic violence remedies as well. We see um, uh, jurisdictions where a person sent to a batter's intervention program has to pay for it. And some jurisdictions are not at all careful about protecting those who can't afford 
um, to do so. And in many jurisdictions, failure to pay becomes a reason to violate, and that becomes the way in which penalties get ratcheted. So I think it's really important to, to examine the way in which our domestic violence responses really are very much a part of the mass incarceration problem, um, is a shorthand way of saying that. Um, and, and, that, um, and that's why you see these programs around the country, these mainstream coalition programs turning in a different direction um, um, and turning away from carceral responses being their prime, not because they want to prevent somebody who wants that from getting it, but rather making that not the focus of their advocacy and turning um, towards anti-racism as a primary practice and a primary focus of their work. Thank you. No, thank you. And, and that you raise a great point. You know, is restorative justice racial justice? You know, um, and Mimi, you know, what are your thoughts? Well, I, I think I shared a lot of my thoughts earlier um, on that. I, although I, I could go on for probably hours about that. Um, I, I just I do want to remind people. And thank you, Donna, for bringing up those points. Um, I want to remind people that just on an individual basis, the criminal justice system as we know it now has not been working for so many people. So to say to, I understand the critiques of what we're, what we're trying to raise here, but uh, it has to be seen in that way. Also, I mean, no, we haven't talked that much about what's been happening in June, but there has been an incredible uprising of people that I uh, have in no uncertain terms, and that includes many people I'm sure on this call, that there is something seriously wrong with um, not, over, not even just an over-reliance on the uh, criminal justice system, but the, the very nature of the criminal justice system. This is a defund the police moment. In some ways, we, because we have in so many ways been prevented from actually growing a lot of this work, except in these, for example, these transformative justice processes that have been developed, generally got developed in completely voluntary organizations with no money. And yet there are many, many uh, uh, ideas and um, an incredible amount of knowledge that has been produced by um, practitioners. We have now are starting to have, we have still have very, very few programs that are in the restorative justice and evaluated type um, field, which is why I think Mary Cause's work is really important and why I am happy about the opportunity, opportunity to do something that's a little bit more systematic, a little more funded, and something where we can actually evaluate the program. But there are not many of them. Why? Because one, we've had, a, people call it carceral feminism. I have been part of that system. I understand it quite well. We've had 40 years of a buildup of a system that said, don't do it. Don't do restorative justice, don't. Oh, and every caution um, has come up. Believe me, I've been hearing them for the last 20 years. And you know, I, I know, I know they, they come from a good place and I'm, I'm seeing them on the chat, even though I think you were supposed to send them to Q&A, not to the panelists. Um, but I have seen them and I understand those concerns. We have had 40 years of investing in carceral solutions. We have had 40 years of um, almost a, a prohibition of doing anything else with some of us just doing it under the radar and in the every by any means necessary. Some of us getting into a little slot where the, the somewhat legitimized. But if you have no opportunities to practice on a large scale, how do you expect to have perfect processes? I mean, this is people have done this work despite every discouragement, at least in um, the United States. So I think that uh, this defund the police moment gives us opportunities to actually do more exper experimental work in a more systematic way. And what I'm urging us to do is do experimental work that allows for opportunities that are not reliant on law enforcement to develop. Look at the materials. There are tons of materials now. I mean, not tons. There is there are more and more materials available and certain nights and things since June, there's been like a tripling of materials that are available, including this webinar. Um, we will have more, look for that. Um, there's a role for everybody to play in this, but I think it also takes a little bit of humility and also a, a broad political analysis of why is it that we have only allowed 
uh, options to be legitimized if they supported white supremacy, I'm sorry, and the carceral state. I, that's, that's been pretty much it. Um, I know because I have developed programs for people of color that were pretty much a colorized version of those options. And it, uh, many of us came to the point uh, where we were asking ourselves, why is it that we're reproducing the same model when that is not what people are asking for in our communities and not what we wanna do. And we had to break some of those taboos to do the work we wanted, uh, we wanted to do. We see this happening more now in campuses. I wanna give a shout out to the work of Circes Mendes, who's been working on uh, applying some of these principles within campus um, settings. And there's been more, you, it might not be things that got uplifted in literature yet, but where I want to uplift some of it in this webinar so we can start paying attention. Thank you. You know, um, in, in looking at some of the questions, we, I think um, they were uh, surround hearing a little more about long term access to RJ. How does um, the admission work um, in your programs, um, especially if the harm doer is resistant to it, and um, we'd love to hear a little more. Um, I guess I can speak to that um, in terms of the program that we, we're developing right now, which is, um, you know, just, it's just one approach. So I I'm really don't want to say that we, we are going to share uh, what we've come up with, but not to say it has to be this way, but this is what we learned. Um, it is voluntary. And right now, because it's under the radar, we actually don't, you know, we, we're not having the, the onslaught of, of requests um, in part because we're trying to do this in a careful way as you would do in a pilot. Um, that we do a lot of questioning around uh, who people, it has so far been the survivor of violence that has come forward. Well, actually we have a couple of exceptions to that. Um, so a lot of the initial questions are around readiness. Um, most of the people coming forward have been survivors of violence. Is, are they, uh, what, what do they think about the willingness of the person who caused harm? And I wonder, I, I know that that language is triggering right now to some people, but I'm going to use that. Um, in being part of this process, looking at safety concerns, looking at willingness and looking at whether or not that person has other people around them who could support them in coming forward to actually be reflective, asking themselves questions. Because we're not um, law enforcement, this is not, you know, we, we're not subjecting somebody to uh, arrest, imprisonment and so on, at least, although, Certainly we do not discourage survivors from doing that if that's the, the direction they wanna go um, so that we can have a more reflective process to, to um, ask people. So I think uh, uh, someone looking like they're not willing is not necessarily going to stop us at least from asking and inquiring as to whether there are factors and conditions that are available to change that towards a willingness to be reflective and towards a, a willingness to actually move towards what we see as a really um, kind of an upward process towards taking um, accountability. Um, how that works is something I think that we're still working on and we look to um, our experiences in transformative justice and the, the other kinds of programs like Mary Casas to, to tell us more about what are the conditions to actually increase the possibility of that change. I was just, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. Dipti, and we, and we didn't really, I don't think we really talked about reparative plans. Maybe Mary did, but I know Mary, it would, um, the Restore program had a very extensive kind of um, follow up. I was just, this is an invitation, Mary. <laughs> I'm so intimidated by all you people. You're, you know, I, I just feel so narrow in common in in contrast. Okay, a redress plan. Um, we required forensic ex assessment to make sure that we weren't working with people who were multiple offenders or in other ways 
that prosecutors had not identified were dangerous to the community. Uh, we required that um, they have a stay away order, that uh, we put the burden on the responsible person to uh, notify us if they had seen the uh, victim survivor rather than the opposite way around. Because if we heard from the victim survivor first, then it, this was something that was brought to the attention of our community board as a violation of the program rules. Um, the, our participants had um, weekly phone contact and monthly face-to-face -face with the caseworker. They were, we administered a risk assessment, a formal risk assessment at that face-to-face -face monthly to make sure that things hadn't changed in the person's life that would change the calculus of their safety to remain in the community. Uh, let's see, uh, we, uh, at the very end, we had, I mean, people came to the community board quarterly to make them still feel connected to the community, to provide a group of people who could problem solve with them on how to get their plan done. But also these were the people who were invested with the decision about, are you gonna be terminated from the program? Because we felt that was a community level decision. At the very end, our participants, um, had to, uh, were guided uh, to write a letter of reflection and reintegration. We didn't call it an apology. It was supposed to be bigger than that. Mm -hmm. And we actually published a couple papers looking at the quality of these reflections compared to research in the United Kingdom on apologies by sex offenders in general. I skipped over the fact that victims had input into, I mean, we had a template because we wanted to be proportional. We wanted to avoid um, too much or too little. So that was why I just described a template, but we did have victim input. Oftentimes it was what kind of community service she would like the person to, she or he, our victims were all she's, but the whatever um, would like the person to do. And uh, we only had one person who asked for a lot of money it was $10,000. And we just had to say, that's not what our system is designed for. But most of the things were, they made you wanna cry. Somebody who in fighting off the, um, responsible person had broken a necklace that, that had been given to her by her daughter and was emotionally significant. She brought the receipt for this necklace from Penny's and it cost $79. And what she wanted, most wanted was to have this necklace replaced. And so I, I could give you a number of other examples where reparations were very symbolic they, um, they were very individually meaningful. Um, so there's no way you would template that. Mm -hmm. There always needs to be space for, but what does repairing harm mean to you? What, what's gonna help you with your process? So thanks for asking, Donna. And I, I'd also just like to add one thing. Um, I, there seems to be this assumption that outcomes mean um, everybody goes back to like living with one another. And that's not <laughs> an outcome. I mean, in many cases that doesn't happen at all. So, um, and I understand the instinct, right? Because I had this too, when I first came to this work, I remember based on my cultural background and people talked about tradition and meant like, just go back to the family and stop complaining. And um, I, um, was very disturbed by that, but that's not, you know, there are definitely outcomes that involve never seeing each other again, right? Along with a plan that you promise to get help, change your behavior, figure out why your first response is anger or violence. Um, but protection is a big part of this, right? And protection might mean staying out of my life. 
I, I was just going to add, I did a, a comparative review where I looked at restorative justice programs um, that dealt with uh, intimate partner violence in the US and programs around the world. And, and I won't surprise you to know that there are, it's far more common right now in a number of European countries, as well as in New Zealand, Australia, um, and, um, and, and other countries as well. Um, and, and I think that um, most of the programs I looked at and most of the programs I'm aware of here, you have a facilitator who is following the person, um, the responsible person and uh, making sure that they um, comply with the plan. Um, that's certainly true for the family group conferencing that or the um, victim offender dialogue that comes, um, that's for example, um, pre-charge diversion um, out of the court. Um, and so while um, the ins what happens inside in those programs, what happens inside the group um, is confidential. Um, the, if the person um, doesn't follow up with the program in those programs, then there's the, um, then there's the option of going back to, to, to court. Um, one thing I didn't mention um, that, that um, um, as a caution is that um, those of you who are working on programs, um, RJ or TJ, I think one thing to, to remember is that um, statements that are made in the development of restorative justice may be admissible um, in uh, subsequent um, civil or criminal matters unless you have uh, an MOU, for example, with the prosecutor that they won't use that evidence. Um, it's one of that's the way in which um, impact justice takes care of this issue. Um, you may have some statutory protections as well, but if you if you don't, then um, then I think that's a that is a significant issue to be um, to be aware of. Great, thank you. You know, um, just as we close, I want to give an opportunity to each of you to kind of end with some closing remarks. Um, I think a lot was discussed today and the comments really um, sort of highlight the need and um, uh, appreciate what you all are bringing to this field. Um, I see a perna on my screen first. <laughs> my apologies, I, I missed some of that. Can you say that again? Sorry. No, uh, we have about three minutes left and I was hoping each of you can share sort of uh, final closing thoughts um, on this topic before we end. Um, I think, there's a lot to cover in, on these topics. Um, and it's, I know it's, I mean, if, it, I'll say this. I think that most of us, I don't know who is populating the audience, but most of us are um, taught from a very young age that justice looks a certain way. And it's um, in all forms of media um, that, our justice system looks a certain way. And then, you know, in the US, we see an adversarial style of justice. Um, and it's hard to come out of that, right? And it's hard to extricate yourself from that. And so I would just say one of the things that's important when you're really looking at other practices or other forms of justice is to, to try to take a step back from that and really look at it for what it is. Um, I'm not suggesting that you'll come to the same conclusion that I come to, but I think that it would be, um, it would allow you to see your own system for what it is, um, for the drawbacks that it has, and maybe see what you can learn from other styles of, of practices. Thank you, I see Dominic. Um, thank you. I, I just glancing at some of the comments, I, I, I think that um, I would hope that maybe we can have some dialogue that's focused on the issues around intimate partner violence and those that are around um, sexual harm that is not within an intimate relationship. And um, we tried to provide an overview and do some of, some of both of that, but there are that creates some limits to the conversation. Um, I guess in closing, I would just say um, two things, really. Restorative justice is not a panacea. 
Um, it's um, it's certainly not going to change the intersecting subordinating system systems that produce violence. Um, but I think that it can be really useful, and I think it can um, prevent some of the harms that are created by the violence of the state. Um, and, and so I think it's a useful thing to pursue. And I, I also want to caution us that I think there is um, the risk that um, what I think of as crime logic um, um, really becoming the frame for which we understand um, our responses to violence. So this is picking up on what Aparna said. The, um, if we continue to measure the seriousness with which we take violence by the um, degree of violence that we inflict on the person who committed violence, then, um, then I think that we will not be able to actually move forward in thinking about how to transform our society and how to transform the, um, the lives of people who, who commit violence and who've been affected by violence um, in a meaningful way. And so I think we have to examine um, um, our commitments and um, in, in those terms. Thank you. Um, and just quickly, Mary and Mimi, if you have any closing thoughts, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, yeah, hard to close this. Uh, you just got a snapshot. Um, my friends will, if they're on, will laugh. This is just from the Creative Interventions project I talked about that we wrote up an almost 600 page mm -hmm. toolkit just on that project alone. Um, it's available for free on the website. So uh, download get a lot of paper and, um, and some people in Spain just translate into Spanish. So there's a lot of information. Uh, it's, I, I really hope you see that as, as an opening to these questions and not a closing. You know, don't, if, if you're not satisfied with the answers here, you may have other people that can answer in a more satisfactory way or if we had more time, we may be able to do so ourselves. So thank you so much for actually being interested enough to jump in on this conversation today. Mary? Uh, I just like to close by saying that in the 1970s, the victim movements in both um, domestic violence and sexual assault were driven by people who were survivors themselves. And so there was a personal intuition that was brought to the work and it was, had very meaningful grassroots bottom up influence into how response centers initially formed themselves. After the passage of um, VAWA and the movement becoming so professionalized and so pr privileging the criminal justice system, we've really seen um, a change to now where everything is top down and we, we um, have, I believe, lost touch with victims' voices. So why I'm really encouraged to have participated with all of you today is that you are beautiful examples of people who are listening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone for joining us today for this free webinar. Uh, we'd also like to express our gratitude to this esteemed group of panelists. Uh, you're all doing such critical work and we wanna thank you for taking the time of your schedule to share your experiences. The Commission on Domestic and Sexual Violence provides training and support policy initiatives to improve legal responses to gender-based violence. For more information or technical assistance, please go to ambar.org forward slash CDSV. The section of civil rights and social justice provides free webinars and resources for legal professionals and advocates nationwide. We hope this helps you and your work. And again, if you can, please consider joining and becoming an active member in the ADA. You may also do so at ambar.org forward slash CRSJ. You can find information on other free programs on the CRSJ website. Best of luck in your work and stay safe, everyone. Thank you.